was great to see those names again. But if you don't know me, my name is Daniel Han, and I am like Funda. I'm a colleague of Funda. We actually started at the same time at UMass Boston. And I'm like Funda also into computer graphics and visualization. So here's the slightly older picture where we have the high end virtual reality equipment. Some people who take or who took CS460 might know these um, nice glasses. And I also like pretty colors. And in general, I've so this is the HoloLens, the first generation a while back. I enjoy virtual reality and so on. So all kinds of visualizations. And here at UMass Boston, I teach computer graphics. I actually teach it this fall. And in the spring, I teach CS410, the software engineering course, which is also the capstone course for undergraduates. But Funda, here in this course, are mainly graduate students? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so for graduate students, I teach uh, well, I, yeah, I teach something called CS666. Previously, it was CS480, CS697, Biomedical Signal and Image Processing. And this is my favorite course, actually, because it really deals with the, my research components, which are biomedical signal and image, images. And so this course, now offered as CS666 in the spring, offers you like the overview of all kinds of modalities and signals there are in the biomedical field. And especially in the Boston area, there are so many hospitals and institutions. So it's a really good preparation to finding a job if you like pretty pictures and also want to have an impact on patients or on biology or medicine. So this is a course to take. And so CS410, CS666 will be available in the spring, in the coming spring. And especially in the CS410 course, we do visualization projects as well. So CS460 graphics for sure, this is all scientific visualization, but in 410, we do this project-based um, this project based content. And for instance, one very successful project was last year in connection with the, the Broad Institute. And this project was called Cell Profiler Analyst Web. And I'm saying this in this visualization context because I'm speaking about visualization today is the this was presented at the IEEE Visualization Conference, which is the top venue for visualization research. And this was a short paper. And the first author of this paper, Bella Bidek, actually then went to Cornell for her graduate studies. So this was a great uh, example of successful research projects coming from CS410. We have other ones also from CS460, but all of this is kind of related to visualization, scientific visualization, and so on. For these courses, I always start with an intro. And here's an intro for CS460. So this is every lecture starts like this. Yes, so this is a CS460 lecture. This was little Aiden giving the voice over. For CS480 or now CS666, the intro looks like this. And last but not least, the CS410, the intro starts like this. And all these intros are scientific visualizations using WebGL, running live in the browser. Oh, nothing is visible for this one, right? Still so strange. Let me, let me try again. Oh, there it comes. I don't know. Sometimes, like very rarely, it doesn't work. This was made by students, by the way. Today, we will learn about Docker containers and DevOps. 
This is lecture 19. So the point of these intros is just to summarize the current lecture to tell the students what's happening. But if you want to learn how to make these intros, then CS460 computer graphics would be a good course because they these intros were made by students, at least the last two, as final projects in CS460. All right, but today we're not going to talk about computer graphics that much or scientific visualization. We talk about information visualization because this is very much related to UI design to the content of this course. And here today I'll I'll build off two slide decks. My friend Nam Woo Kim from Boston College Design, and this is my friend Nam uh, during our PhD graduation. So thank you, Nam, very much for. Uh, providing the, this content and these slides. And if you, and Professor Nam is uh, like an um, information visualization researcher. He does excellent stuff. So check out his website at namwkim.org. And he also always looks for student interns. If you want to work at Boston College, he's a very nice advisor. All right, the goal today of this presentation today is to understand the value of visualization. And the value of visualization really, really comes from data, or like it allows you to see a data in a certain way. And with data, I mean big data, small data, data is now everywhere in this space, right? We have like data science as a very prominent discipline and so on. So this is all anchored in the data, the visualizations. Here's some examples for data. For instance, this one is an electronic health record of a patient where you have the different encounters you have the labs of this patient's medication, vital signs, procedures, visualized as these blocks as a timeline over time, right? So this is one example. Another example is this one. And this one is a visualization of Uber trips, right? On the left, you see if people take separate trips with uh, Uber X, right, individual cars. And on the right, you see the same traffic or like the same map snippet with Uber pool trips, and you see the traffic volume is blue on the right. So when people share cars, right, the traffic goes down. No surprise there. All right, another one, another visual example visualization is this one. This is a map visualization uh, showing crime in the Boston area. And what do we see as a first thing? We see that there's no crime at UMass Boston, which is very good for us. Another example is maybe personal activity. If you like to go on a hike or take a bike ride or other types of travel, you can visualize that on a map. So these are different types of visualizations of data, right? Different types. They, call, they come in all kinds of types and shapes. But the important part to know and to realize is that the, the volume of data really increases drastically, still increased. And over the last 10 years, really, really increased a lot. So people talk right now about the industrial revolution of data. And this is actually um, a famous data scientist, uh, Professor Hellerstein from uh, UC Berkeley. And now in the field of visualization, we can also speak or we can use this industrial revolution of data as a driver for visualization. And with more data, we also need to work on our data literacy, which means the ability to understand data, to extract value from it, to visualize the data, and very important for visualization, to communicate the message of data. And with so much data, with this increase in data, we also need uh, to realize there's a trade-off between the overflow of information and the attention. So if we need to, if we want to process so much data, it's hard to keep focused. And here is exactly where visualization can come in. It can help you to process these large amounts of data which exists everywhere in the world. So visualization, when we think of it, we think of visualization for analysis and communication. So what really is visualization? And visualization can come in all kinds of shapes and forms. For instance, there can be art, like these plate decorations. Visualizations can be used for political stuff, like this map, map visualization, Democrats versus Republican, 
or it can also be used for computer scientists to represent machine learning algorithms or the training of machine learning algorithms here with TensorBoard, which is a visualizer for TensorFlow, which you all know, right? So visual representations convey information. This is, th these are visualizations and visualizations can be grouped into different sections. For instance, information visualization, data visualization, information graphics, data graphics, or information design. And we really today will focus on information visualization and data visualization. So before I continue, who has experience visualizing data? Funda, did you speak about visualization already a little bit in this course? No, I, I haven't. Okay. okay, so especially if you're a graduate student, if you're a PhD student doing research, right, then you might have used charts in papers to convey information, to show results, training plots, training curves, right? Mm -hmm. ROC curves, stuff like this. These are all visualizations. Right, but we also... actually talked about these, yeah. Okay, okay, uh -huh. great. Yeah. And we also like see visualizations essentially everywhere. For instance, the New York Times is famous to create nice interactive visualizations on the web whenever it's suitable. They have actually a design lab, just a design group just for this. And they are very, very successful also in the research field of visualization. So yeah, visualizations really have different components. It's a huge space. Today we'll talk about information visualization and data visualization. So one question you might ask when it comes to data, often we think of tables. So what about tables? Are tables a visualization? And the community says yes, tables are a visualization. And here we have a data set on the left. What's your dream company with these companies? And then a percentage of people voted for this company as a dream company. And if you look at it, okay, you can understand Google is number rank number one, you can parse this information like this. But now the same data is visualized on the right with a horizontal bar chart. And here you immediately see the difference between Google and Apple and this ranking is just easier to digest. You know, the, the cognitive load of processing the data set on the left as a table is higher than the cognitive load of like understanding or looking at this, this, this plot on the right. So this brings us to the question, why is visualization important? And one of the classic examples to understand why visualization of data sets of tab tabular data is important is the Anscombe's Quartet. And Anscombe's Quartet works as follows. Anscombe, that's a researcher, he defined these four data sets, A, B, C, D. These data sets have X and Y variables, and they all have similar statistics, which means similar mean, similar standard variation, uh, uh, deviation, similar, similar variance, and also similar um, uh, linear regression properties. So if you look at this, you would say based on the statistics, these data sets are very similar. But now if you plot this data, then you will see that actually these four data sets are very, di are very different. See, so here in data set B, you have the curve, data set D, you have like them all set, uh, clumped together here and then one, one outlier here, data set C is one outlier here, otherwise on a straight line, here's left and right of this um mean line so even so the statistical properties are the same of these four data sets the when visualizing the data they are very different so now Anscombe based on his this quartet data set set make both calculations and graphs it's very important to understand the depths of the data set you can't just plot the data that can be misleading and you can't just do statistical calculations because you might miss information. Another example is this one. It's an animation. You see different plots have similar statistical properties. After the data only changes, these properties only changes three after digits, right? So everything else, the mean for X and Y is the same, standard deviation, correlation is the same. And even so, you already have a T-Rex when you plot the data or a star or these lines. So it's very different when you look at, when you compare these different data sets. Another example was a study where 
people were given two data sets and these two data sets report the number of steps here, like 15,000 steps associated with a body mass index. So BMI and these two data sets are one is for uh, born males, one is for born females. So it's, it's grouped by gender. And then they gave these data sets to a group of researchers and asked, is there a correlation between gender steps and body mass index? And then some people plotted the data and it turns out if you plot the data, it's all fake data, you see this gorilla, you know? So the, the study they did is like, if you get this data set and don't know what the, what the, the question to answer is, then you probably plot the data, you explore the data, and then you discover the gorilla. So if you are hypothesis free, you don't know what you're looking for in the data, then you might use visualization to explore the data and see the gorilla. But if you're focused on this correlation, you don't even think so much about exploring the data with a visualization approach, and you do not see the gorilla. So the majority of people did not see the gorilla if they did if they were just looking for the correlation just to check if male female impact this statistics but if you don't look for a specific answer to a research question then you might plot the data and see the gorilla interesting right so if you just get these two data sets you would probably not think of the gorilla so this there's a famous saying in computer science that you might know, and the saying is the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. This was said in the 1960s by Richard Hamming. Now there's a, a visualization pioneer, Ben Schneiderman, who phrased this for visualization. And he said, the purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures. So really seeing something in the data rather than getting a pretty picture. So visualization is important, not because of pretty pictures, but it allows us to see the unseen, like the gorilla, which you don't see in the plain table data. So how does that help or how does it work? Well, it turns out that us humans have actually incredible performance when it comes to visual perception. We have an extremely high bandwidth for information processing. So we can actually process information in parallel rather than just serial iterative. And we can detect patterns very well using the visual system. You see here comparison of all five senses and the visual system has the highest bandwidth of 10 million bits per second while touching a second place and then the other senses have less throughput than that. So the visual perception is one of our best senses. And visual methods can support cognition, right? So a visual memory aid, for instance, here, when we multiply these two numbers really helps. So if you do it in your head without any help, without any aid, then you will be much slower. So here's the answer. Of course, you did that really quick, right? And that's so 2448. But if you would use pen and paper, the time to do solve this is much shorter than if you would do it in your head without any help. So it's all about the cognitive, reducing the cognitive load when exploring data sets and visualization can really help with that. There are these three functions of visualization to record information, to support analytic reasoning, or to communicate information to others. So let's look at some examples, visualizations, and we can discuss which function this visualization fulfills. And the first I want to look at is actually very old visualization from 6,000 years before, before year zero. And it's called the Konya town map. And what this is, this is actually um, a cave painting of this mountain and a village which was sitting uh, uh, beneath the mountain. So this is the first, uh, or like one of the oldest visualizations that exist. Now, what do you think? 
what is the purpose of this visualization? Is it re to record information, to support analytical reasoning, or to communicate information to others? So Kunal says in the chat, communicate information to others. Yeah, maybe, you know, if you visit the cave, they wanted to talk about their village, right? Um, but I think uh, one of the main points here of creating these cave drawings were to record the information for future generations, to keep a memory of something. Maybe all of them. Yeah, maybe I just that's right. Maybe all of them support analytical reasoning. Well, support analytical reasoning definitely comes in when there's look when we look at these visualizations from Leonardo da Vinci. You know, here they made very specific drawings of mechanical processes, like here these machines we drew very carefully so this helps to process a structure but also communicates information to others by having this explosion which they still use in common in, in current computer aided design softwares right and also to record information of course here's another one from 1600 galileo galilei he made drawings of the moon and you see that there's this larger structure here which is actually one of the largest craters, maybe the largest crater on the moon, the Alba Tegnius crater. And now if you look at this, is this a realistic drawing? Uh, sorry, it was hard to hear. Can you say that again? Okay, so I don't think it's realistic, right? Like this one, this not, it's not at scale, but uh, it still um, communicates the point, right? That on this side of the moon, we have the crater. Another one, and this is actually the first example of these motion pictures, motion animation, the horse in motion by Muybridge in 1800s, where they created these stencils of the horse moving which you can could play in a fast fashion to see the animated horse running so if we so and some people know like i know who take who took computer graphics knows this but if you play this animation how many frames per second do we need to see a smooth motion for the human eye So the, yeah, Kudal has it right. So 24 frames per second is actually the threshold for us seeing smooth animations. So usually, yes, 30 to 60 frames per second would be very nice and computer screens go with 60 frames per second. So when we do computer graphics visualization or animations, we count 60 frames per second as let's say the gold standard or our target, but 24 is what's required to see smooth animations. So this is the first time somebody created these stop animations based on stencils and you could play it very quickly to see the horse galloping. Now, the, so this is one of my favorite old visualizations is the cholera map from Jon Snow from the 1850s. And what happened was that there was the cholera pandemic, right? Like there was uh, many people died. And what Jon Snow did, he marked on a map the number of bodies at this location. And when he looked at this map after, so these lines, these, these bars essentially are lines of bodies, you know, so many people died in the city. But if you, when you looked at the map, when he visualized it like this, he also then saw the locations of water pumps. So these are water pumps. And then he noticed that many death cases were around this one water pump was one water well which was the broad street well so here we saw okay look how many people died there and then this was really the the cause of the cholera outbreak because they discovered that there was a dump site some trash was leaking into this well and it was contaminated and that's how then the cholera spread and without this visualization it would have been hard to track down so this is a they actually have this book the ghost map which describes 
how um, Jon Snow came up with this map visualization and then how they uh, solved this case. Another one is the visualization by Nightingale in 1858, where she wanted to convince to the general public that the war is not going so well and many soldiers are dying, but not because of battle wounds, but because of diseases. And that's where he dis she de um, invented this coxcomb chart, which is still very popular today. It's like a pie chart, but it has these extensions to amplify each slice. And here you see in the gray pattern that these are diseases and it's like much higher than the deaths from battle wounds or other causes. So diseases and the, the condition of the army was so poor that so many people, so many soldiers died. And another one is this one, Napoleon's March to Moscow from 1869. This is maybe the number one famous visualization. And what this one this depicts is the following. So 422,000 troops marched this pass to Moscow. And you see already on the way through the war, the, the numbers got reduced. So I would say comparing this width of the line to this one, this is roughly a quarter. So maybe like 100,000 the soldiers actually reached Moscow. And then in black, we have the, after they were, they were done conquering and so on, they were retreating back to France. And what happened on the way back is that this number of 100,000 was reduced even further to only 10,000 of 422,000 soldiers survived. So up here already some down from the war and then on the way back, why did so many die on the way back? So, and then Charles Joseph Minard also visualized the temperature drops. So here's temperature zero in Celsius. So the winter came and the temperature went down to minus 30 degrees Celsius. And that's where so many people really then died out of cold. So it's the winter implication that happened. And that's why the numbers beyond the war were even further reduced. So now we looked at a few visualizations. Let's summarize. So visualizations convey information, right? They amplify the cognition to see the unseen because our visual perception has the highest bandwidth. And there's three functions, record, analyze, and communicate data. So the goal of the next part of this lecture is actually to understand some rules of thumbs to design effective visualizations. And now let's start with a little exercise. If I would ask you to draw three sketches to visualize the numbers, what would you do? 42 and 23, visualize this relationship. A bar chart would be an option, right? We have like a longer bar for 42 and then 23, a lower bar. That will be one option. Do you have another idea? Any chart, for instance, what charts do we know? Pie chart, for instance. Pie chart could also visualize this relationship, right? 42 here, and then the 22 is a little sliver like this. Here's the bar chart, but also the numbers itself, Arabic numbers can be seen as a visualization or the scatter plot, right? We could put uh, dots for 23 and 42 and see this relation like this. So these are very likely results to visualize these two quantities, pie chart, bar chart. That's, uh, yeah, that's something we could come up with, right? But now think of, artists like Picasso. And this is an example of where Picasso draw the bull. And Picasso draw the bull first very realistic and then he went and abstracted more and more until he had a very, very um, abstract representation of the bull with just these lines, right? So from one step to another, he made it so uh, from realistic to abstract. And similar, Kandinsky, another artist, 
created these incredible compositions which are world famous so if you look at this link they actually made different versions with different level of detail different abstraction this one is probably the most famous composition number eight from 1920s he did that look there like sometimes gaps between 10 years or longer between these different versions of the composition so he reinvented the style of depicting the similar scene and we can do the same with in the field of visualization and researchers do this all the time so what if we would have now as a task to draw three new sketches to visualize the numbers so not the bar chart and pie charts how do you have uh, any idea any creative idea what we, you would do lines for instance yes that's a good good idea or we could create like um, dots for each one, 42 dots versus 23 dots, you know, quantities like this. And there's a researcher, Santiago Ortiz, in 2012, he described 45 ways to convey two quantities. And let's take a look. So here are like these dots and you can make these dots maybe smaller or you can make for, um, you can group the dots, right? And make some larger, some smaller. You can make just lines. You can make horizontal bar charts, vertical bar charts can have this line plot or um, you can have this shape here filled line plot or these bars where you have it's like almost like a progress bar you can make this also vertical or you can visualize using circles like this in a different way than pie charts or other area shapes or you could even plot it uh, on a map using lo longitude and latitude or visualizations like this. And there are endless ways of comparing uh, visually two quantities, right? There's so many ways of doing that. So if there are so many ways of comparing two, just even two numbers, how do we design ideal visualizations, very good visualizations that people have the ability to understand with very little cognitive load? So what is the ideal visualization design? And this really depends on multiple factors. It depends on the type of data, right? So whether it's network data, whether it's spatial data, like map data, whether it's temporal, like time-oriented sequence data, whether the, it, it depends on the context, what you want to do, like want to communicate or analyze the data set, or do you want to um, perform tasks like identifying trends compare values what are really the questions to answer or what is the message you want to deliver with your visualization and these things these dependencies are also our design constraints to create a visualization so you might ask then are there guidelines for visualization design and professor nam lists these five different guidelines for visualization design. First, truthful. Second, functional. Third, beautiful. Fourth, insightful. And fifth, enlightening. And today we'll actually speak about truthful, functional, and beautiful. These three design guidelines. And at this point, this actually, what I'm doing now is very famous in visualization lectures. We look at plot from fox news because fox news is very good at deceiving the public based on these plots so this one is a plot showing the top tax rate once a tax cut expires so what do you think about this plot this is a little bit older but like what do you think about it the message is still valid So what's the message when you look at this plot, you know? What's the message Fox News wants you to see? It's misleading, why is that?
so it's like a four percent that's correct it's a four percent increase right but it looks huge the way they show it the scale is narrow somebody says so only a slight increase in percent percentage looks drastic and that's absolutely correct you know if we would plot this as a more scientific plot then it would look like this we have like the correct scale and so on so it's the same data right and you see there's still of course there's a change but it's not that big you know so here was like it looks like wow it's like quadrupled the tax rate but it's really it's there's a change of course there's an increase but it's compared to the overall tax rate it's not that big so this is very misleading and so this is both of them are bar charts right and when it comes to his bar charts bar charts should always have a zero baseline so they should always start with zero percent because you are comparing lengths the ratio of lengths so it's very misleading if you start with a baseline of, of uh, something different than zero. So for line charts, they may not have a zero baseline. So you can also visualize the same data as a line chart and there you judge an angle, you know, so line chart would now be just this, this plot on this line and you see, okay, the slope goes up. So this angle, actually, the, you measure this angle with this invisible line for a line chart. Here, you don't really need the zero baseline because it's really just about the slope of this line. You're judging the angle, the interval. So for bar charts, you need to start with zero baseline. For line charts, it's fine to start not with zero baseline because you judge the angle. But what's important for line charts are the aspect ratios, because this is the same data three times, so different plot, so not, not anymore the text card, but like three times the different data uh, as uh, line charts. And here the aspect ratio is different. And if you judge the slope, right, the aspect ratio is actually very important. You think here, okay, there's a drop. Then you see, think here in this plot, the drop is very drastic. And in this plot, you think, oh, the drop is like more like evened out over the time, you know, so it's not that drastic. So a rule of thumb for this banking is actually 45 degrees to minimize the errors in visual judgment of slopes. This is for line charts. And of course, Fox News also uses line charts. So what do you think about this plot? So here we notice that like the X axis is somehow arbitrary scaled, right? We have here from March to June, here from December to September, nine months here, from September to March is like six months, from March to June is only three months. And it looks like the they are equally spaced, but they're like really random cherry pick quarters. It's really weird to range it like this, right? Oh, actually like this is the, not six months, uh, six months is from March 2009 to, June, so that's 13 months from here to here is 12. It's also 13 months and here is like um, nine months, right? But it looks, it looks weird. So it's like somehow random cherry pick quarters. It doesn't make much sense. It's not very scientific. And then what else is going on? If you compare these numbers here, 7 million, 9 million, from 9 million to 13.5, and from 13.5 to 15 million, it's an incorrect Y scale if you measure the distance. So 2 million here is the difference, this is 138 pixels. Now for the difference of 4.5 million is 172 pixels. So also very strange to arrange it like this, right? So there's no scientific background in the way that shows the the dots here and adjusted this 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 line so what does this plot even show it says like job loss by quarter so 15 million job loss by quarter is also very misleading it's a misleading title this is really the number of unemployment right so that what they want to show is like the number of unemployment and if you look at the data in a scientific way that fox news showed in this misleading graph then you would see and this is the same period of time from 2007 December to June um, 2010 right so you see in red the real data 
and it's it's clearly visible now that after 2009 kind of the number of un unemployment stabilized while in the pr plot of fox news you have this slope which indicates it's going up like crazy you know so this is the correct data plotted in red here while fox news showed it in a misleading way and the way and not only fox news does that right so like many other news or advertisements do these strange plots where we don't have the scientific background so researchers went and defined the formula of a lie factor so this is part of the concept of graphical integrity there's a researcher called edward tufty who's also a pioneer in the field of visualization so for graphical integrity Tufti says the representation of numbers should be directly proportional to the numerical quantities measured. So he suggests this lie factor where you divide the size of the effect in the graphic to the size of the effect in the data. And the higher the lie factor, the more misleading the graph is. And if we now go back to the first Fox News plot, the lie factor example, if you calculate the pixels, pixel values here versus the actual change in the uh, encoded values, then the lie factor is 36. And that's a huge lie factor. So researchers define these metrics to check whether plots or charts are truthful. Here's another example. Gun deaths in Florida. So are gun deaths decreasing or increasing? And what they highlight here is the 2005 Stand Your Ground Law. And if you look at it at first glance, you see here's when 2005, when the Stand Your Ground Law was initialized, and then the curve goes down. So it's very misleading because if you look at the y-axis, the zeros on top, and actually down means there are more deaths, gun deaths now after this um this uh, this law was enacted. So let's fix this. So if we plot it like this and put the zero in the bottom, then you see, okay, it goes first up the, after the stand your ground law is initialized and then goes down a little bit. But in general, it's over the time than it was be before 2005. So flipping the plot is also another trick which really can mislead at first glance. Here's another one where we have GDP, the global GDP of the world versus the German GDP. And if you just look at the plot, it looks like, wow, Germany is re doing really well when it comes to economy. But then you realize, okay, there are completely different scales. For the, for the German plot, we, have, we are in single digit trillion. And for the global GDP, it's like double digit trillion. So the scale is completely unmatched. And this concept of strange scales or like misleading graphs also is used by climate change um, critics who think that the climate change does not exist, right? So here's a world average temperature from 1997 to 2012. So based on this plot, they would say, yeah, it goes up and down and stays in the same area. You know? The problem is that this temperature, mean temperature is actually only partial data. And if you look at the data in context, you see that there's a clear increase, a glo global warming is real, right? So the clear in increase of the overall temperature. So it went, when it comes to truthful visualizations, it's important to tell the truth. Is there a question? Well, maybe not, I'll just, uh, okay. All right. So, yeah. So when it comes to uh, visualizations, tell the truth, avoid distortions, show the data in context, don't hide certain aspects and be aware of missing and uncertain data. Also, be sure to disclose your sources to make sure people can see where the data is, uh, came from. So this was part number one of the guidelines. Be truthful. The second one is be functional. So use visual encodings that people understand. And here's another example of visualizing five numbers all over in different ways. So these are all the numbers, 22%, 25%, 34%, 29%, 32%. They are, these visualizations all visualize the same things, but some are more useful than others. 
It's very hard, for instance, to see the relationship between those numbers with U and shade, right? Also with the, using the line weight, it's very hard to realize area also not very good. I would say bar charts probably make it more clear. And this one has a nice scale. So you see like C is the highest number very easily, but also area, so area is hard to digest. Angle area also not too easy to compare, for instance, D and E, which one is larger? Hard to know this way, right? So Professor Funda just put a link in the chat. Let me pull this up. Uh -huh. As an Indian woman, I can confirm that too much of my time is spent hiding behind a rock, praying the terrifying gang, terrifying gang of international giant ladies and the Latvian general don't find me. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Average female height by country. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that's also very misleading. We have the, the figures here, right? And the scale, the, it looks like the scale starts at zero. It obviously doesn't. So that's a good example of a misleading graph. This one graph. cracks nice me up point. every time. So it's yeah, that's okay. very it's funny. Example. I should definitely keep that open and add it to the slides. Very good. So there is this website called the Data Visualization Catalog, which is actually pretty useful. You can click on it and then you see the different visual encodings and they are described as pros and cons you know if you click on bar chart it describes what's happening it um, gives examples there's a guide to bar charts for designing so this is a great resource to design your to choose the right type of plot candlestick chart some more advanced some other some less advanced so it's really a good resource for free datavizcatalog.com now let's look at these plots and this is not this is another very commonly studied research question in visualization look at these pie charts do they represent different data these let's say this is data set a b and c what do you think about these three data sets are they similar or different Well, it's very hard to see, right? So if we would plot this as bar charts, then we see that in data set A, we have this trend of going up, while data set B is more steady and data set C goes down from A to B. So that is very interesting. This is not easily visible in the pie charts and pie charts have this angle encoding, right? The angle encodes the data while bar charts encode the lengths. And pie charts in general in the visualization community I have a bad reputation. Here's another example, which is uh, a, um, a, a real pie chart out in the in the world, right? But it's hard to understand. It's very hard to understand because there are so many different slices. There are too many colors and the color contrast is very bad. So digesting this information is not easy. This one is a little better, right? So from here, to here, this one is looks a little bit more friendly with these lines and in general, not mixing the color in the cognitive load is reduced and we can understand it a little better. But now look at this horizontal bar chart and here, this is much easier to digest. So this one really works better than even this reduced pie chart without the colors. So looking at horizontal bars is easier for us humans. And of course, Fox News also uses pie charts. So what's wrong with this one? First of all, it doesn't add up to 100%, right? That's like very, very strange, right? And another thing is, that it doesn't start at 12 p.m. Usually, if you use pie charts, you should start at least at 12 p.m. here to have it easily digestible. And also, this is 3D. 3D pie charts or 3D plots in general are always hard to digest or hard to judge. And so this is a bad example for a pie chart. Here's some rules for good pie charts or like rules of thumb if you, design, if you need to use pie charts. So first of all, you compare each part to the whole. So it should only have a small number of slices. So you can do this better. You should sort the values. You should start at 12 o'clock and maybe even use alternatives like bar chart. But the efficient, the, the good part of pie charts is that everything is compressed into one circle. So it's compact. And there are some companies, 
for instance, Apple who like to use pie charts. Now, what do you think about this one? So this plot was done actually by Steve Jobs, rest in peace. So first of all, he starts at 12 o'clock, that's good. And then he wants to show that Apple has a significant portion of the share of US smartphones. And this was probably after the first iPhone was released maybe a year later or so. So what they do is they trick a little bit because green is Apple, right? They put it in the center. And now since it is a 3D visualization, this is a little bit tilted. So the front facing segment is larger than it should be. Second, the, the, the numbers are not ordered. So it looks like this green chunk is larger than the 21%, even so it's the only 19%. So it's really a little bit misleading. So it's, it seems to be that Apple is second largest smartphone manufacturer, while it's really the third largest because there are a bunch of other manufacturers which are here con adding to 21 percent so this is a little misleading from steve jobs and 3d plots in general are bad right so here are some examples it's hard to digest even this information like which there, there's occlusion you don't know which axis you should look at and so on so 3d plots can lead to occlusion and confusion especially with these ugly colors in the back and this brings us to a very important topic of colors and if you did cs460 then you we talked about it for one whole lecture but colors are important to allow nice processing of visualizations for instance here's an example of a map and this map has a standard color map color table which is called the rainbow color table and the rainbow color table is very common because it looks pretty, right? We have like this visible spectrum inspired colors uh, thing from a rainbow. So it's based on the order of colors in the visible light spectrum. And this is not that efficient visualization researchers know because you can't really directly tell which color represents higher or lower values if we would remove the legends here, right? So there is no perceptual ordering in the rainbow color map so even if you remove the color and just look at the luminance then still it's hard to it's not impossible to see that 0 0.3 is lower than 1.2 right in terms of the luminance also from the hue it's hard to see so rainbow color map has a similar bad reputation than the like pie charts and here's some work from my friend michelle Bokin, who, who was a faculty member at northeastern university where she studied these coronary arteries and the endothelial shear stress ess which affects the the arteries that it can burst and aneurysms can be formed and so on so it's a dangerous thing if there's too much stress on the lumen of a blood vessel so originally the researchers the clinicians used this rainbow color map to visualize the stress on the blood vessel and yeah, you can see here red, okay, up here is a lot, of, a lot of stress, but then down here, you might miss these red spots. So she did an experiment where she changed just the color mapping to something from black to red. So this color map. And with this one, people were much faster with 5.6 seconds per region rather than 10.2 seconds. So roughly almost double as fast and much more accurate too to find these areas of high shear stress so with the new color map 71 percent found uh, of areas were found but 39 percent were only found with the rainbow color map so rainbow color map is not good as well and i told this to students before a good website for choosing a color map color table is colorbrewer.org colorbrewer2.org where you can specify the number of classes you want to visualize and then it comes up with different suggestions for color schemes and i i and especially if you publish papers to visualization conference you need to use these color schemes but in general also for home website design or print design these color um color tables they suggest here are very good 
you know, very readable and so on. You can also select checks like colorblind safe, print friendly, photocopy safe to generate a bunch of colors, which then make a lot of sense in terms of grouping things. So here, this one is three classes. It's a sequential data. So these are the three colors, which you then copy and paste via hex code and use these colors. And it looks really nice if you stick to a design also for layout reasons, right? So Color Brewer 2 is a nice website. Okay, just to summarize, we said for functional visualizations, they need to be readable. The encodings need to be effective. So pie chart is usually not the best way of encoding data. Data types should be supported and it's important to support the analysis task. It should be meaningful for people to understand and questions about the data should be answerable using the visualization. The last part of these five, the last one we're talking about today is beautiful. Beautiful. So visualizations should be beautiful. So the aesthetic component is important as well. So here is an example of a bar chart. And while the axis look good, starting at zero, right? Going nine months, right? And uh, everything is visible. This graph is not the most aesthetic. And why is that? So first of all, all these lines make it hard to digest. We don't need them, right? We can just have it like this and even maybe remove the background to have it clean. But, and, and now we have still this frame of these axes on both sides. We can remove them as well, but then it might be hard to see, okay, is this really 13 or 14% here, the last one? So what they then suggest is transferring this mark and putting it on all of these charts like this. And this is a very beautiful bar chart. Clean aesthetic. And very related to this is this concept of chart junk. And chart junk describes visual elements that are not required in visualizations. So unnecessary visual elements and charts that actually distract the viewer from the information. This was this term was also coined by Tufti in 1983. And Tufti analyzed quite a bit different charts and then found that chart junk in general should be avoided, but sometimes it leads to better, uh, better ability to memorize if you've seen something. So let's take a look. So here's a 3D bar chart, horrible, right? Very hard to read. Like it's hard to see whether this yellow line is above 175 or underneath. Yeah, you see it's a little bit above, but then compared to this one, it's very, very hard. So if you just restructure the same plot, now is a 2D color plot, looks much nicer, much easier to compare these values and so on. So Tufti came up with this data ink ratio, which means like how much ink, print ink, do you need to use to replicate the data compared to the total ink in the graphic? and the data ink ratio in his case should be close to one however and that's where the chart junk comes in there are also plots like this this one shows the employment cost for steel worker per hour across different countries right and this is the same data now you could argue okay on the right side you can quicker compare the different countries but on the left side this actually looks cool right it's like a graphic where you have like these flying sparks you clearly see okay there's a, a a worker here with like this face mask and so on so this is a cool visualization and you can still see that south korea uh, pays steel workers very very little compared to the united states right same information so here the data ink ratio is actually not close to one there's more ink significantly more ink for just this worker illustration here on the right side but it still looks cool so the question the visualization community has is there useful chart chunk here's another example same data visualized in two different ways and you have this monster on the left showing the monstrous costs increasing and actually this monster adds the effect that you can memorize this this may be a little bit more than if you just have looked at this plain bar chart right so useful junk the effects of visual embellishment on comprehension and memorability of charts 
was a Kai paper in 2010 and actually Michelle Borkin who worked on the coronary artery visualization also did a lot of research in this direction and has very recent papers regarding um, useful chart junk. So when it comes to the design of visualizations, things are subjective, right? Some people might like the chart junk visualization, some people don't. So aesthetics, how you perceive the, the plot is also subjective. Style is uh, subjective. It depends on who the designer is and how playful they want to make this chart and how more memorable you want to make this chart. But in general, these are the guidelines for beautiful visualizations. Try to remove unnecessary elements, keep it clean and simple. Use contextual representations that make sense and amplify the understanding of a message. But also don't forget to draw attention and engage the audience. Don't be too boring, too clean. And yeah, try to find a balance there. And if you Google novel visual encodings, you would see a variety of very beautiful visualizations, and some are more useful than others. And one library, which is very popular to design these new visualizations is called D3, D3.js. And it's D3.org is the website, but the package is called D3.js. And this is data-driven documents. And they have a variety of examples for very nice, new interactive visualizations all on the web so if you want to get into the space of information visualization on the web then d3.js is a great framework to learn it's not that easy because uh, they have like this concept of data centric coding so you have these callbacks on change of data and so on which you have to understand before you can make these beautiful visualizations another website which is good for creating nice visualizations or exploring data, especially also as a team, is Observable HQ. It's similar to Jupyter Notebook for Python programming, but I like it because it's all interactive on the web as well. And that's it for today. This is an overview of information visualization um, the, in uh, just this roughly one hour. So thank you very much for your attention. I think we should have a visualization course at UMass Boston, like a whole uh, semester talking about us learning these three and other frameworks like Vega Light is very popular for creating plots. But yeah, let me know any questions and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Daniel. Sure. Any questions? That was great. Okay. I think it's a great idea to have a visualization course. Yes. That would be good. Yeah, I think most other universities or computer science programs have right. that. Right. I know it's, it's getting more and more popular with so much right. more data coming in. And it's really, um, first you would think, okay, visualization is not really computer science, but they place so much into it. And from mm -hmm. a scientific standpoint, like perception research, you know, right. design research. Also then, um, for instance, visualizing data for um like people who can't you have uh some visual impairments for instance mm -hmm. you can't yeah. really see so there's a huge range of researchers looking into this field as well right right we try to address some of these in this course but a fully um just some course that is fully oriented on visualization would be great i think yeah yes any questions for daniel Okay, then thank you very much. All right, have a nice day, everyone. Pleasure to be here. See you later. Bye. Bye.